Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Joan and Elizabeth Shannon? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background of this case. I'll move to the timeline of the crime and offer my analysis. David Shannon grew up in North Dakota. At age 19, he enlisted in the Army and was stationed in upstate New York. He visited a topless bar and met a woman named Joan who worked there. Joan had a difficult childhood. She was traumatized by both her parents and they abandoned her. At age 18, she married a man who mistreated her. The couple had two daughters. One of them, Elizabeth, plays a key role later in the narrative. Joan and David married in 1991. In addition to Joan's daughters, who David adopted, the couple would go on to have two sons. Joan had an insatiable desire for sex. In order to satisfy this desire, the couple became swingers. David performed well in the army. He was eventually promoted to the rank of major. He worked with computer technology and special operations. In 2000, he was transferred to Fort Bragg, which is in Fayetteville, North Carolina. This is the home of the U.S. Army Special Operations Command. David was on track to become a colonel. David and Joan rented a house not far from the base. In Fayetteville, they continued their activity as swingers. They were extremely active in this area. Sometimes they would send their children away so they could meet with other people in their residence. The children would come back to the house and notice that the furniture was rearranged. David would frequently watch Joan have sex with other men, and he would take photographs, thousands of them, which the couple stored among other items, like sex toys, in their residence. They made no effort to hide these items from anyone. David and Joan spent a phenomenal amount of time trying to satisfy their sexual desires. They didn't have time to do anything else. Their house was always very messy. Dirty clothes and trash were all over the place. Joan was an emotionally distant mother. She didn't pay attention to her children. They didn't listen to her commands, but they would sometimes listen to David as he made more of an effort to discipline them. Elizabeth, in particular, rebelled quite a bit. In 2002, when she was 15 years old, she would stay out at night, use drugs, get in fights, skip school, and hang out with the wrong crowd. She would frequently break objects to hurt those who angered her. David put security devices on her bedroom doors and windows, but she would still get out of the house undetected. Elizabeth had a particular contempt for David. She didn't recognize him as an authority figure because he was not her biological father, or at least that's the excuse that she offered. As time went on, David and Joan did nothing to slow down their swinger activity. Eventually, they joined one particular sex club that met at a local hotel where they would have recreational sex parties once a month. The club would rent two adjoining hotel rooms, a reception room, and a room for more vigorous activity. One could think of it as a reduced clothing zone. Generally, the club only welcomed male-female couples. In order for one person to get in, their partner had to be with them. David and Joan enjoyed their activities at this club, but Joan still had one desire that was unfulfilled. She wanted to have sex with a black man. There weren't any in the club. David went online and found a black man named Jeff, who was also in the army. Jeff was described as an average-looking man in his 30s. He was married and had children, but this didn't stop him from being interested in having sex with David's wife. Jeff agreed to meet at the next sex club party and was permitted entry without a partner. Joan and Jeff had sex during that meeting. Jeff was invited back to the next meeting, which was in March of 2002. After another night of sexual activity, David and Joan returned home as usual, but Joan was preoccupied with Jeff. She was normally able to have sex with a number of partners and not form any attachment, but that was not the case with Jeff. She started meeting with him for one-on-one -on -one private encounters once or twice a week, but then they increased their activity to three or four times a week. David was not initially aware of these meetings. Joan kept them a secret. The relationship between Jeff and Joan expanded outside of just sex. 
Joan viewed them as a couple. She even introduced Jeff to her daughters as her new boyfriend. David noticed that Joan's behavior changed. They no longer had sex, and she was emotionally distant from him. He insisted that she terminate any relationships outside the marriage. Joan was not about to do that. She would not give up her relationship with Jeff. David communicated with Jeff online and told him the party was over, so to speak. Joan was not allowed to see him anymore. Joan and Jeff disregarded David's wishes. In the early summer of 2002, Joan decided that she wanted out of the marriage. This was an interesting position considering Jeff did not want to leave his marriage. Perhaps Joan believed that he would, or she didn't care either way. She just wanted to be away from David. Joan was struggling with the financial aspects of divorce. She wanted an absence of David, but not an absence of his money. She was still in love with the money. That relationship was just fine. The idea of murder occurred to Joan. This would not only save her money, she would actually make money. David had a life insurance policy worth over $700,000. Joan attempted a few times to poison David. She was successful on one occasion, and he became ill, but he did not die. She started thinking about a more effective method to murder him, like using a firearm. But she did not want to go to prison for murder, so she came up with a plan designed to avoid that problem. She started spending time with her daughter, Elizabeth, taking her to restaurants, movies, and on shopping trips. Joan was trying to be an attentive and friendly parental figure. After strengthening her relationship with Elizabeth, Joan asked Elizabeth to kill David. Elizabeth initially indicated that she would not kill her father, but her mother just kept asking. She kept pressuring Elizabeth several times a day. Joan also withdrew her affection from Elizabeth to punish her for not cooperating. Eventually, Elizabeth gave in. She did not want to lose this new relationship with her mother, and she was tired of being harassed. Joan addressed any concerns about Elizabeth going to prison, telling her daughter that she wouldn't get caught, and even if she somehow was arrested, the state would never incarcerate a troubled 15-year-old. David had several guns in the house, and not surprisingly, given the condition of the house, they were left unlocked. Joan retrieved a semi-automatic pistol and gave it to Elizabeth, who took the gun to an open area nearby and practiced shooting it. Now moving to the timeline of the crime. We go to the night of July 22, 2002. There are six people in the Shannon residence, David, Joan, their two sons, Elizabeth and Vera, a friend of Elizabeth's who was visiting. The Shannon's other daughter was not in the house. David and Joan watched a movie. Elizabeth and Vera spent time in Elizabeth's room, and the two boys fell asleep. After Vera went to sleep, Elizabeth put on latex gloves, retrieved the pistol, and entered her parents' bedroom. This was at about 3 a.m., now on July 23. David was in his bed, asleep on his back. Elizabeth approached the bed, pointed the weapon at her father's head, and pulled the trigger. She heard him gurgling after being struck by the bullet. Therefore, she pointed the gun at his chest and fired it a second time. David did not survive. Joan took the gun away from Elizabeth and hid it at a neighbor's house. Joan returned to her house and called 911. She pretended to be hysterical as she told the dispatcher someone had just murdered her husband. She claimed that she woke up after hearing the gunshots. After the police arrived and looked at the scene, they became suspicious about Joan's story. Joan was not crying. Both Joan and Elizabeth were calm and cold. Elizabeth had no blood on her, so it was clear that she did not try to render any assistance to David. There was no forced entry, and nothing was stolen from the house. It didn't take long for investigators to find all these sex toys and other items. Joan admitted the details of the swinger lifestyle, including a relationship with Jeff. The police thought that maybe he had committed the murder, but he had an alibi. The police received an anonymous tip implicating Joan. When they spoke to Vera, again this was Elizabeth's friend, she told them that Elizabeth told her that Elizabeth was the killer and her mother was involved. Joan was arrested on July 30, 2002, and charged with first-degree murder, conspiracy to commit first-degree murder, and accessory after the fact to murder. Elizabeth was arrested on August 2 because 
She had fled and was hiding at a friend's house. She was charged with second-degree murder and conspiracy to commit second-degree murder. Elizabeth pleaded guilty. She was sentenced to 25 to 31 and a half years in prison. Joan pleaded not guilty. She was tried and convicted of all charges. Her sentence was life in prison without the possibility of parole. Now moving to my analysis. There are two main items that can be debated after any conviction, the guilt of the defendant and the fairness of their sentence. This case has two perpetrators and thereby four potential items of debate, but really only two are unclear, specifically the guilt of Joan Shannon and the sentence of Elizabeth Shannon. I say this because if Joan Shannon is guilty, life in prison is appropriate, and there is no question that Elizabeth Shannon is guilty. So those two items of debate are more or less removed from the analysis. First, I'll look at the debate around Joan, then her daughter. Let's examine the factors both for and against the idea that Joan is guilty, starting with the inculpatory factors. There is no question Joan's daughter Elizabeth was the shooter. Elizabeth used one of David's guns. Elizabeth said her mother arranged the murder and even told her friend about it prior to being arrested. Joan was having an affair. She made it clear that she no longer wanted to be married to David. Joan was the sole beneficiary of a substantial life insurance policy. Not long before the murder, she had mysteriously taken an interest in her delinquent daughter. She was calm after the homicide. Joan did not attempt to render aid to her husband. Joan did not identify Elizabeth as the killer, which seems fairly strange. According to Joan, she was asleep when she heard the gunshots and only saw a shadowy figure in the darkness leaving the room. If Joan was really asleep, her eyes should have been adjusted to the dark. It's hard to believe that she wouldn't recognize her daughter as the killer. Furthermore, Joan knew that there was no forced entry and nothing missing from her house, yet she still didn't suspect her daughter. It's difficult to believe that a 15-year-old would spontaneously murder her father without some outside influence. Moving to the exculpatory factors. Most murders are committed by one person. Elizabeth shot her father. Perhaps she was the only killer. Joan's family described Elizabeth as vindictive and capable of falsely implicating her mother. Elizabeth had a long history of criminal behavior and had prior disputes with David. She said that she hated David. Elizabeth had a powerful incentive to implicate her mother, namely a reduced prison sentence. There are no witnesses who can corroborate Elizabeth's story about her mother orchestrating the murder. When considering all the evidence in this case, do I think that Joan Shannon was guilty? I believe she was guilty in reality, but I am not convinced beyond a reasonable doubt. The jury in this case also struggled quite a bit to come to a verdict. This was not an open and shut case. I think that it is reasonable to believe Elizabeth could have acted alone. Now moving to the debate around Elizabeth's prison sentence. Running under the assumption that both Joan and Elizabeth were guilty, was Elizabeth's sentence fair? Again, she was sentenced to 25 to 31 and a half years. It is likely that she will be released in her early 40s. This is a challenging situation Joan had a lot of power over her daughter. Elizabeth was probably rebelling because she didn't have any supervision. She wasn't getting any positive attention. At the same time, Elizabeth was not a fan of her stepfather. Joan was easily able to manipulate her daughter into committing murder. Given the tremendous power differential that exists between a mother and a daughter, some people believe this sentence was a bit harsh. I think just plain 25 years would have been fine rather than the range that extends up to 31 and a half years. Many people who are convicted of murder never have a chance of parole. Elizabeth will be out at a relatively young age. Regardless of what contributed to her behavior, the murder was so cold and calculated, a significant amount of time in prison is warranted. I do think that this case offers an important lesson on the dangers of manipulation, and certainly Joan bears the majority of the criminal responsibility. Now moving to my final thoughts. Joan's traumatic experiences when she was young may have led to her insatiable sex drive. Even though some people are able to separate sex from love, 
there is always a risk of becoming genuinely attached to a sexual partner. In this case, Joan thought that she fell in love with Jeff, but her ability to empathize was so poor, and she had such a terrible understanding of love that she didn't understand Jeff was stringing her along. She didn't realize he wasn't serious about being with her, and he had no intentions of leaving his wife. He was just using Joan. The same lack of empathy that left Joan vulnerable to this manipulation facilitated the murder. Joan didn't empathize with anybody, not with David, not with her daughter, not with her affair partner. She was willing to do whatever was necessary to get her way, regardless of who was destroyed in the process. Those are my thoughts in the case of Joan and Elizabeth Shannon. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching.